Welcome back to Spoonful of Sugar. Today's episode will be hosted by Will Foose, one of my classmates at Drexel University College of Medicine. Enjoy! Hey future doctors, thank you for tuning in to Spoonful of Sugar, a podcast made for medical students by medical students to help the medicine go down. My name is Will Foose, and I'm one of Rhea's fourth year classmates at Drexel University College of Medicine. I'm going into ophthalmology, and I will be your host for today. Today, we're going to cover normal anatomy and physiology of the eye, including refractive error. Our goal is to set a foundation for interpreting ophthalmologic questions and to help you make sense of what starts out as a pretty confusing organ. I'll be asking you some questions of my own. Now, ophthalmology is a pretty confusing specialty. It has its own lingo and nuances that a lot of physicians aren't exposed to. So don't feel bad if you don't get them all. To start out, we're going to be talking about the eye anatomy and physiology. We're going to start out with the surface of the eye. The outermost layer of the eye is the conjunctiva. This is a transparent mucous membrane overlying the sclera, and it also goes onto the eyelids. The eyelid conjunctiva is known as the palpebral conjunctiva, as well as the conjunctiva on the eyeball itself is the bulbar conjunctiva. This is the mucous membrane that turns yellow when you have icterus. Uh, even though it's called scleral icterus, it's actually in the conjunctiva. Fun fact. The way I think of this is kind of as the skin for the eyeball. It's the outermost surface. Next, we have the sclera. This is underneath the conjunctiva. This is the white part of your eye, and it's made up of type 1 collagen. Muscle is attached to it underneath the conjunctiva. What disease is associated with a blue sclera? If you said osteogenesis imperfecta, you would be correct. Next, we have the cornea. This is continuous with the sclera, but it's the transparent surface on the front of the eyeball. It's kind of like the glass of a snow globe. This is where ulcers and abrasions can occur. It's incredibly sensitive and full of neurons and is innervated by the trigeminal nerve, which we'll talk about when we talk about neuro-ophthalmology. Its surface is maintained by tears, and it is made of three layers. From outside to in, we have the epithelium, which is stratified squamous, the stroma, and the endothelium. The endothelium is divided from the stroma by a basement membrane known as decimase membrane. Next question. What is the role of the endothelium of the cornea? The endothelium of the cornea is responsible for keeping the corneal stroma clear. It does this by pumping water out of it and keeps it dehydrated. I like to think of the eye's surface as kind of a bed. Now, this all really depends on how you like to make your bed. But I think of the pillow as the cornea kind of poking up, and then you have the covers of the bed, the conjunctiva. It goes right up to the edge of the cornea, and then the mattress is the sclera. So hopefully, if you make your bed, you don't put your covers over top of the pillow, because then this analogy breaks down. And also, you need to realize that the sclera is continuous with the cornea, and uh, it does not lie under it like a bed mattress does to a pillow. Next, we have the anterior segment of the eye. Now, it's important to note there is an anterior and a posterior segment of the eye. There are also anterior and posterior chambers of the eye, which we'll talk about. But both the anterior and posterior chamber are part of the anterior segment. Now, it's important to note that you should have a firm grasp of your autonomic nervous system when you think about the eye, especially the anterior segment. This really all boils down to the sympathetic nervous system is always flight or fight, and parasympathetic nervous system is rest and digest, or if you like the other acronym, dumbbells. I always think of the parasympathetic nervous system as that which secretes things. So GI secretions, for instance, the D, diarrhea and dumbbells, that's how I think of the parasympathetic nervous system. If you can remember this, it's really easy to understand the physiology and function of the eye and how it'll react in certain situations, especially with drug reactions, for example. So we'll start with the anterior chamber, 
which is a portion of the anterior segment of the eye. The anterior chamber is filled with aqueous humor. This is a clear fluid that circulates from the posterior chamber into the anterior chamber, and it nourishes the corneal endothelium. Next question, what produces aqueous humor? If you said the ciliary body, you'd be right. We'll talk about that in a moment. Another thing to know about the anterior chamber is you have the iris. This is the pigmented colored part of the eye. It's one-third of what we call the uvea. It, it surrounds the pupil, which is the negative space in the middle of the iris. And it functions as both a dilator, which you have radially-oriented muscle, and a sphincter, which has circumferentially-oriented muscle. Uh, the way I think of any sort of sphincter muscle is as a drawstring purse. Remember, if you draw a line in the direction of the muscle fibers, that line must shorten for the muscle to contract. Also remember that the iris is autonomically innervated by cranial nerve number three, which we'll talk about in neuro-ophthalmology, but particularly by the ciliary branches. Next, we have the trabecular meshwork, or the TM, as ophthalmologists like to call it. This allows for aqueous humor to drain at the angle of the eye where the iris meets the cornea. It's a microscopic structure, so it's kind of hard to see without certain lenses. But it's important because it can be opened by muscarinic drugs, those uh, affecting the parasympathetic nervous system, like pilocarpine, which can be important for glaucoma. Next, we have Schlem's canal. This is a circumferential moat that you can't really see, but helps to drain aqueous, and it drains from the trabecular meshwork. Next, we have a question about the anterior segment particularly the anterior chamber. What is the function of the pupil that is sympathetically innervated? If you said dilatory function, that would be correct. Another word for this is midriatic or midriasis. I always try to remember this because dilate and midriasis both have a D in the word. Remember that sympathetic means fight or flight. So you want your pupil to be bigger so you can see more light and potentially see more danger in that situation. Next question, which function of the pupil is parasympathetically innervated? If you said constriction, that would be correct. This is called meiosis. I only remember this because it's not mydriasis and does not have a D in it, so therefore it must be constriction. Remember, parasympathetic means rest and digest. You don't need to see light when you're sleeping. Hence, the pupil will constrict. Next, we have the posterior chamber. Now remember, we're still in the anterior segment, but the divider between the anterior and the posterior chamber is the iris. The first thing to think about in this is the lens. This is a clear, flexible peanut M&M that is made primarily of protein. Now I say peanut M&M, because we like to think of the lens in three parts. It has a nucleus at the center, a cortex around that, and then a capsule encompassing everything. This isn't very relevant to step one, but if you're interested in ophthalmology, it becomes very important. Now the lens is responsible for focusing light onto the retina, and this is where cataracts can occur. Now the lens is held in place by zonular fibers, or zonules, or Z fibers, and these attach the lens to the ciliary body. That thing that we said earlier creates aqueous humor. Now the ciliary body, this is the second of three parts that make up the uvea. It's continuous with the iris when you think about it, but it's tucked away just behind. And it creates aqueous humor, like I said before. But also, it acts like a sphincter, just like the iris. So, once again, that's kind of a drawstring purse. That, and when it contracts, it narrows. It moves towards the center, or the edges move closer to the lens. Now this relaxes the zonular fibers, which allows the lens to essentially become fatter, increasing its capacity for magnification and focusing on up-close objects, which we'll talk about when we talk about accommodation. Now that we've finished the anterior segment, we're going to talk about the posterior segment a little bit. So the posterior segment involves the vitreous chamber. Now this is a gel-like substance that fills the posterior segment, and it's entirely behind the lens. Next, we have the retina, 
Now this is made up of neurons, photoreceptors, and pigmentary cells that allow you to sense light. This is what you want to focus light on in order to perceive it. Light usually hits the outermost retinal layers, that is, the closest to the choroid and sclera, and then the signal moves back towards the inner layers, towards the vitreous, or towards the center of the eye, and then moves along the nerves to the optic nerve. Now, next question. What word do we use to describe a picture of the retina? If you said fundus, or a fundoscopic fo photograph, you would be correct. Now, the retina is also made up of certain parts. One part we like to think of in particular is the macula. This is the area of central vision. It is a little less vascular than the rest of the retina, particularly at the fovea, which is the very center of your vision. Now, it is temporal, or closer to the ear, when compared to the optic nerve. Next, we have the optic nerve. This is cranial nerve number two, and this provides sensory information from the retina back to the brain, and we'll talk about it a lot in neuro-ophthalmology. But it is on the nasal side of the retina, which means it's closer to the nose than the macula. All of the blood vessels radiate out from this, and it has a natural cup, which should be less than half the diameter of the nerve. The cup to disc ratio, which is usually described as a number less than one, is very important for describing diseases like glaucoma. Next, we have the vessels in the retina. Now, these are the veins in the arteries. The veins are usually bigger and darker. They're the very prominent vessels. And the arteries are usually a little bit smaller, and they have very clearly visible walls, and usually appear a little bit lighter than the veins. And next, we have the choroid. This is a plexus of blood vessels, and it lies underneath the retina. It's between the retina and the sclera, and this is the third part of the uvea. Now, we've been talking about this uvea, so I have a question. Do you remember what the first two parts of the uvea are? If you said iris and ciliary body, you'd be correct. The uvea is made up of three parts, the choroid, the iris, and the ciliary body. So when you hear terms like uveitis, usually it's referring to inflammation of one of these. Next question. In order, what two clear structures must light pass through before reaching the retina? If you said cornea and then the lens, you'd be correct. Now there are other structures that are associated with the eye that we like to talk about, and we'll refer to these as the adnexa or adnexal structures. These we'll cover very briefly. First, we have the nasolacrimal ducts. These drain tears that come from the eye into the nose, and they have two puncta, or little holes, on the medial portion of the eyelids. Now, next question. Where in the nose does the nasolacrimal duct drain? If you said the inferior nasal meatus, you'd be correct. Now, if there's a nasal lacrimal duct, there's also a lacrimal gland producing the tears, and this helps to nourish and maintain the epithelium of the cornea, the very surface of it. Now, there's a certain prefix we use for anything involving lacrimal. Can you tell me what that is? If you said dacrio, you'd be right. So this involves diseases like dacryoadenitis, which is inflammation of the lacrimal ducts, or dacryocystitis, which can be sort of like an infection of the nasolacrimal sac caused by obstruction of the nasolacrimal duct. Now, we also have the eyelids. Those are pretty self-explanatory, but it's important to know that they contain meibomian glands. These are on the inside of the lids, and they secrete mucus that helps to prevent tears from evaporating. Then there are sebaceous glands, just like the skin. These are near the eyelashes and help to support those follicles. As we talked about earlier, sympathetic innervation is very important, and there's one particular muscle, the superior tarsal muscle, which is also called Mueller's muscle, which is innervated in the upper eyelid. And this is what is lacking when you have Horner's syndrome and you have a bit of a droopy eyelid or ptosis. Now that we've covered some basic anatomy of the eye, we're going to start talking about refractive error. Refractive error is an issue with the way that light is bent, hence it affects vision. Thus, diseases that impact the retina or visual component of the nervous system would not be included in refractive error. If a patient's eye problems correct by having them look through a pinhole, usually this issue is related to refractive error. Any guesses why? 
So if you have a patient look through a pinhole, light can only enter in what approximates a straight line. Thus, unless the very central axis of your vision is occluded or just completely warped, which is usually very unlikely, the light has a straight unaltered shot right towards your retina. This isn't the case when multiple rays of light have to be focused on a fixed point, which is the case when you don't have pinholing. When you think about refractive error, think of it as the strength of your eye to bend light in order to focus it on the retina. That's the goal, is to focus this light on the retina, specifically the fovea, your central vision. Imagine two beams of light entering a 2D slice of your eye. One enters at the top of the pupil and the other at the bottom. Your eye must bend those two lights to meet at a point. Ideally, this should be at the retina. When it isn't, that is refractive error. We usually standardize this at a distance of 20 feet, hence the 20-20 notation, which I like to think of is you see at 20 feet what you should see at 20 feet, versus 20-40 is you see at 20 feet what you should see at 40 feet. The first refractive error you should know about is hyperopia. Hyper, the prefix, means far. Hence, you should always hear hyperopia and think farsighted. These people can see far, but not close. However, you must think of it in hyperopic patients as their eyes are weak. It can only weakly bend light. That's why it can see far away. Far objects send light in what approximates a straight line. Thus, you can see them through a pinhole because they appear small. Light traveling far away does not need to be bent to focus it. However, light rays coming from close-up objects that appear bigger will be wider and further apart. These light rays will need to be bent more than the eye can provide. So, hyperopic eyes are weak, particularly because they are short. Light doesn't have enough time to move to a focal point on the closer retina in shorter eyes. Thus, the focal point will not be on the retina where it is supposed to be, but behind it. This is corrected with glasses that bend more light. Hence, the prescription is usually positive because positive equals strengthening the eye. And like I said, hyperopic eyes are weak. Convex or converging lenses are the most beneficial for creating a positive prescription. Just think of how your lens of your normal eye gets fatter, allowing you to focus on near objects. It also provides magnification in this situation. Thus, hyperopic people will have eyes that appear larger in their glasses. Now that we have hyperopia, the opposite of this is myopia. Unfortunately, this doesn't have a cool prefix like hypo, but you just have to remember that myopia is the opposite of hyperopia. If hyperopia is farsightedness, then myopia must be nearsightedness. Thus, these people can see close up, they're nearsighted, but they can't see far away. This is largely the opposite of hyperopia. In this case, the eye is too strong because it is too long. Thus, their focal point is in front of the retina because they bend light so strongly. These people need concave or diverging lenses, so thinner, not as fat lenses, to weaken their eyes because their wide eyes, like I said, are too strong. These patients have prescriptions that are negative, hence weakening their eyes. Myopic patients will have eyes that appear smaller when they have their glass prescriptions on. Next question. People with short, weak eyes that focus light behind the retina, preventing them from seeing close-up objects, have what condition? If you said hyperopia or farsightedness, you would be correct. Next question. Vice versa. People with long, strong eyes that focus light too strongly in front of the retina have what condition? If you said myopia, you would be correct, or nearsightedness. Next, besides hyperopia and myopia, which usually refer to the length of the eye, we have astigmatism. Astigmatism is another component of our prescription. This is when your cornea, 
although it can also be applicable to your lens, but for the most part, it's usually the cornea, is curved abnormally. It's not the perfect dome that it is supposed to be. Maybe think of it more like a football that has been cut in half and rotated, and it can be rotated in different directions. This causes light to be out of focus, but it is out of focus in different axes. Cylindrical lenses are how we fix astigmatism. Now it's important to know with refractive error what accommodation is. Accommodation is a normal phenomenon. This is your ability to focus on close-up objects. It requires the lens of your eye, that peanut M&M, to be able to fatten. And this brings objects into focus, especially those that are closer up. In order for that lens to fatten, the ciliary body has to constrict, which relaxes the zonules, and then allows the lens with its natural flexibility to fatten and basically produce magnification. This happens also when you cross your eyes to focus on a pencil in front of your eyes, and it can be associated in ki far-sighted kids with what we call accommodative esotropia, which involves kids that have crossed eyes in order to allow their lens to fatten and focus light better onto their retina. Now, accommodation is lost in conditions like presbyopia, which we'll talk about in a second, and in cataract surgery, in which the lens is completely removed and replaced with an artificial lens, and this doesn't have as much capacity to fatten as a normal lens. So now we'll talk about presbyopia. So our next question is, what does the prefix presby or presbyo mean? If you said old, you'd be correct. This is the prefix that we see in conditions like presbyopia in this case, which means old eyes, or presbycusis, which means old ears, when older folks are hard of hearing. Now, presbyopia is the natural loss of the ability of the eyes to accommodate. This happens with normal aging. As you age, the proteins in your lens get less flexible and they fix in the lens. No matter how hard you can constrict your ciliary body with this and relax the zonules, the lens still refuses to fatten because of these proteins that have essentially become less flexible. And so the eye can't focus on up close objects. Now this normally happens to people at the age of about 40, and hence old people will say that their eyes are going and they need readers. And usually this starts at that age, at about 40. So older folks will need reading glasses. These glasses normally have a small positive prescription to allow for magnification and up close reading. Now please note, of course, the lens of the eye and the ciliary body can allow you to focus your vision. You're probably doing this without thinking about it when you're reading or doing other up-close ta tasks. So ultimately, some refractive error can be overcome with eye strain. Now when I say eye strain, it won't actually damage your eyes. It's just that uncomfortable feeling when you're focusing on an object. However, some people's eyes are shaped thus that they cannot overcome this natural hyperopia or myopia and those patients are the ones that need glasses. So next question, when will you not be able to overcome refractive error with eye strain? Like we said before, you won't be able to overcome refractive error when the lens gets inflexible and this is what occurs when you are presbyopic. Now I wanted to end with a fun fact. I know a lot of people have difficulty spelling the word ophthalmology. So it's important to know that there are two H's in this word. So to spell ophthalmology, it is O-P-H-T-H-A-L-M-O-L-O-G-Y. Please remember that fact. So now we're going to recap everything. Please remember to be cognizant of the autonomic nervous system in regards to the eye's function and anatomy. Be familiar with different structures in the eye, especially the cornea, the lens, and the ciliary body. Think of the iris as both a sphincter and a dilator, and think of the ciliary body as a sphincter or drawstring purse. Now refractive error, like we said, stems from the eye's ability or inability to bend light correctly, and this ultimately comes usually from the shape of the eye. 
Hyperopia, like its name suggests, means farsighted, but the eye is ultimately weak and unable to bend light efficiently. Myopia is nearsighted, but the eye is too strong at bending light, and usually the eye is much longer. Astigmatism is abnormal curvature, normally of the cornea, and presbyopia is an age-related loss of accommodation. Thank you for listening. If you found this episode helpful, please subscribe to our podcast and leave your questions, comments, and concerns at spoonfulofsugar.org. Spoonful of Sugar is always here to help the medicine go down.